Hey folks, JR, back for another episode of Echoes of Shannon Street Case File. It's going to be episode 82, Press Conference Part 6. We've probably got just maybe two or three more parts left and then we're going to we're going to go back to the follow-up investigation and leave the press conference alone. I want to get a couple episodes in with the, some of the questions asked by the media. All right, folks, and don't forget, please, if you get a chance, hit that subscribe button. Also, get down in the description. You can click on that link down there and come visit the Facebook site and my website. If you're out on the road, you can check out the podcast. Well, you can buy you a copy of the book, a copy of the documentary. All right, folks. If you'll recall, the director was describing the attack unit going through the house and in the order of which the suspects were shot, according to what their investigation shows so far. So let's uh, let's jump right into that. One fired a shotgun. This subject, David Jordan, received a gunshot wound to the head, and which is fatal. He also received an injury to the left arm in the left to right direction. We believe at this point another, the fifth suspect, correction, subject, Cassell Harris is struck by the same rounds that are being fired at Jordan, and he receives a gunshot to the head, left to right, forward to back. It's a possibility that Harris was in a prone position and received fire that was directed at Jordan. By this time, Watson, Summers, Rutherford, and McNair have moved through here, indicating the living room because at the time the director's doing this he's got a he's got a drawing of the house up on the stage with him and throughout here indicating the front bedroom and it is at this point they find officer hester's body lying at the front door to the right of the front door officers hubbard and ray make their sweep through this room, the west bedroom, and they join the other four officers at the front door. While two of the officers are furnishing security or cover, the other officers get the front door open and remove the body of the officer to the front porch, summon medical aid, and determine immediately that Officer Hester is dead. Correction, that the officer is dead. I noticed throughout this press conference, the director doesn't like to use Officer Hester's name, Bobby Hester. I don't know if there's anything to that or not. Officer Watson comes back to the bedroom door between the west and rear bedrooms. Officer Rutherford has started his second sweep back in the direction towards says towards the front door of the west bedroom. Officer Watson here, Rutherford here, and obviously the director is pointing at this drawing of the house. They look in through the different doors of the bedroom. They see the six suspect crawling with the pistol in his hand or with a pistol. They fire. This subject is Michael Coleman. Injuries are to his palm, right wrist, and into his head. The trajectory would indicate at this point he was shot. The pistol was extended in an aimed position, and the fire, the fatal fire, was received from the front bedroom door. Was that correct? Now, evidently, saying, is that correct? The director must be looking back towards 
I don't remember if the medical examiner's at this news conference or not. If you recall the picture from one of the episodes a few episodes ago, you saw the command staff all sitting on the stage. But obviously he is looking back to get confirmation from somebody on the stage. Almost simultaneously with the action occurring here in the west bedroom, Officer Summers has entered the back bedroom, which is the last bedroom that has not been checked. He sees something up here next to the bed. He then moves to check and doesn't discover anything of significance, but he does detect something on the other side of the bed, a large round bed. Officer McNair has moved in to support Officer Summers. I'm sorry, to support the officer. Officer Summers jumps over the bed, looks over it, and finds the seventh suspect, Andrew Houston, lying on the floor on his back, pistol in hand, cocked, lying on the floor. Officer Summers fires three rounds into this suspect and, of course, neutralizes the threat. That, in effect, completes the assault of the house. There are some additional searching, of course. There was probably five, seven, eight minutes delay waiting for (laughs) gas to clear further so that the attic could be checked before the house could finally be declared secure. We did learn through the subsequent investigation that apparently this individual had been shot, talking about Andrew Houston, in an earlier exchange when the officers first entered the house and called for backup assistance. He had an injury to his back that we believe would have been very painful, although not serious or not fatal. Now, of course, what he's talking about, the wounds that Andrew Houston got, if you'll recall, the not only the autopsy of Andrew Houston, but also a statement of Lieutenant Summers, no relation to the TAC officer Summers. If you'll recall during his statement, he talked about firing shots through the kitchen window into a suspect that was crawling across the kitchen floor. That's going to be Houston. That's the wounds that the director's talking about. Lindbergh Sanders did have a gunshot injury to the arm. I believe there was one other. There was one that had a knee injury, and this is the individual, Coleman, that had a pistol. One pistol, as I say, was in the hands of the suspect, Houston, at the time he was shot. There was a box cutter in the hand of the individual, Lernell Sanders. And there were two hunting knives. One just on the edge of the bed, one just beside, on, in this area. One of the first questions we had was, why this particular room? As I say, this drawing is not the scale. But when you see a scale drawing, this is probably the most defensible area in the house. They have a line of fire to the front door. They have just a step in either case. They have a line of fire to the back door. If you recall, folks, we've discussed this on a couple of different episodes about why the members were probably gathered in the northwest bedroom. There were only two firearms that were found, one that this individual had in his hand and one this individual fell on when he went down that he had in his hand at the time that he was shot. We believe that these weapons probably changed hands several times during the assault. There were 12 expended 38 holes discovered in the rooms. Six were found in this area, and he's indicating the west bedroom, northwest bedroom. We have every reason to believe these were ejected holes 
that were ejected during the assault on the house so that the weapon could be reloaded. There were three found in the front bedroom, and there were two expended rounds in the pistol held by this individual. And folks, if you recall, we did an episode on the number of rounds that were found inside the house expended in live rounds and how many rounds the suspects would have fired in total. And we also found six live rounds that had fresh blood on them in the front bedroom, the area from where the officers first received fire. Our belief is that during the first exchange of gunfire during the assault, the individual that was in this area was attempting to reload when he was injured, dropping the ammunition before he moved on, which is uh, that's a, that's a pretty good point. I think when we went over the TAC unit's statement, I think we, if you'll recall, the crime scene officers mentioned that there were rounds found in the northeast bedroom that had blood on them. Now, of course, they didn't state whether the blood was fresh or not. I think at the time of that episode, I think my thought was these were just rounds that were laying there had been laying there and had blood from Bobby Hester. But if it's fresh blood, then obviously that that's a good point made by the director that suspect fired and was attempting to reload. But if you recall the TAC unit statements, they talk like there wasn't anybody in that bedroom, so I don't know. That's as closely as we can reconstruct the sequence of events during the assault. Our investigation has satisfied us and the descriptions as furnished by the officers are very accurate. Our analysis of the injuries of the trajectories are all consistent with what the officers have told us. Although, as I've stated several times, it will be some period of time before we get the final results. I don't know that there's anything else I can say. We've been at this several hours, but again, we felt the citizens of Memphis were entitled to an in-depth explanation of what occurred. We feel our officers are entitled to an in-depth investigation of what occurred, and I hope I've been able to give you give that to you today. I don't know what else I can tell you. I've tried to be as complete and as detailed as possible. I will entertain questions if they are pertinent or on something I can answer. And folks, next episode, we'll get into some of the questions and answers. But uh, the director is accurate in that they took the statements of the TAC officers, or in fact, all the officers from start to finish, and you compare it to the physical evidence. And when you're talking about the trajectory of the rounds, and you're talking about the medical examiner, and the medical examiner is, is a sharp fella. In fact, everybody in the ME's office were pretty sharp fellas. And then you had your blood experts. But I, I'm just telling you folks, you can't shoot seven people and then just make up a story at least a story that's going to fly, because I'm telling you, if you're lying about what happened, it's going to come out. They didn't just line those people up and shoot them. They didn't lay them on the floor and shoot them, because if they had of, it would have come out. The medical examiner would have caught it. They would have looked at how the rounds went through the body, and they said there was something wrong. And if you remember, they pulled the carpet up in that bedroom looking for rounds. So this is not just a police department investigation. This is not just a police department conclusion. And you had the medical examiner's office. You've got the the blood people from uh, University of Tennessee here in Memphis. You've got the Shelby County Attorney General's office. You even had the federal government look at it at one point. So I, I'm just telling you, folks, you... You're not going to get that many people to lie. You're just not going to do it. They don't want to go to prison because that's what would happen if they lied. The medical examiner is not going to destroy his career, nor any of the other medical examiners going to just 
destroy their career in order to try to cover up for a police officer. That's just not going to happen. So what the director said there would be accurate. All right, folks, that's going to be all for this episode here. I think everything the director said during this episode as well is is accurate, as accurate as we know it can be. We've went through those statements and we've went through the medical examiner's reports concerning the autopsies. Now we know we're we're hearing what is as accurate of information as you can get and that we know that you're just not going to be able to make stuff up because of the physical evidence. The medical examiner, they're going to catch a lie. All right, folks, before we get out of here, I forgot on the last episode to talk about the Little Red Square, so we'll go and knock it out now. That's from 2011. I was lieutenant over a vice narcotics team. I sure did learn a lot from those guys and girls because I didn't know anything about such stuff. But I had a I had a good time and I sure did learn a lot. They were a sharp, sharp group. Even though some of the members changed over the next few years. It, it was uh it was a really good time. I really enjoyed it. They're super sharp. It's a good place to work, organized crime unit. At least it was when I was there. All right, folks. That's going to wrap it up. I appreciate you. We'll get back together in a few days and continue on with the journey here. And until then, I will see you down the road.